Welcome to Reimagining Liberty, a show about the emancipatory and cosmopolitan case for radical social, political, and economic freedom. I'm Aaron Ross Powell. Both the short and long-term impact of AI technologies is unknown, but it's almost certain to be significant. It will destroy some industries, accelerate others, and revolutionize still more. And it seems no one has a lukewarm opinion about AI. You're either excited about its prospects or convinced it's nothing more than intellectual property theft or the inevitable end of the market for human creativity. Worries are particularly acute about what this means for journalism, and those worries are worth taking seriously given the importance of quality journalism to a free society and a functioning democracy. My guest today, writer Julian Sanchez, has worked as a journalist and policy analyst and thought quite a lot about these issues. He joins me for a conversation about AI, the state of content creation, and the future of journalism as a profession. If you enjoy Reimagining Liberty, I encourage you to subscribe to my free newsletter, where I write frequently about the kinds of issues we discuss on the show. And if you want to support my work, you can become a member and get early access to all new episodes. Learn more by heading to reimaginingliberty.com. With that, let's turn to my conversation with Julian. Recently, I saw a poll someone had made on the social media site threads asking the question, do you think that artificial intelligence and the related technologies will be a net benefit or net harmful to society, you know, just in general. Maybe we start there. What do you think? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think potentially a net benefit, but I think, you know, as with a lot of the technologies, as with arguably with print, um, there is probably a long lead time where it's going to be on net more disruptive than uh, than helpful. I mean, I think you can make the case that in its first you know, century or two, uh, print was uh, a, a pretty big problem on that. I think you can tie the early modern witch panics uh, pretty tightly to uh, print, to books uh, like the Malaeus Maleficarum and uh, the spread of sort of the, the viral meme of the idea of witchcraft. Um, obviously, and depending on your theology, maybe this is good or bad, but we saw centuries of, of, of religious warfare um, that are uh, intimately connected to um, the, sort of the new capability to uh, uh, have widely dispersed scripture and, and more diverse interpretations of scripture. Um, and, you know, I think sort of analogously that we will eventually, I think, probably find ways in which um, AI is, is going to be massively beneficial, um, but that's going to be disruptive, I think, in a lot of ways. First, because I think a lot of people are going to find uh, malign applications for it um, that are uh, more easy to rapidly deploy than the benign ones. Um, and also just because I think it, it's going to take a long time to figure out what the role of human beings is when um, a lot of cognitive work can be uh, done by automated systems that, that uh, you know, currently is sort of aspirational work for humans. I mean, it used to be um, the dream of automation for a long time was, um, well, once the machines can do you know, the drudge work and the manual labor, humans will at last be free to you know, write poetry and, and, uh, and novels and make paintings and create sculptures. Um, and, you know, there's this, a plausible sort of dystopian future where um, now that the computers can take care of making the paintings and writing the novels, um, humans are free to clean the sewers. That seems like it has an element of snobbishness in its concern. And this is something that I notice in in the critiques of this technology, which is that nobody complained about automation most of us are not buying artisanal bread, right? The bread that we buy was, manu was yep. made in a factory at scale. It's using techniques that bakers developed over the centuries or millennia. 
but it's machines just cranking out another loaf of bread that looks exactly the same and are not, you know, inventing new ways. There's no heart and soul in the loaves at the the grocery store. But no one really complains about that. There isn't this like widespread movement on social media to yell at anyone who mentions that they went grocery shopping. Right. No, I agree. Um, and look, I'm, I'm, I'm voicing this critique just to sort of have it out there more than to endorse it. But, uh, you know, but I think this goes back to the idea of, uh, of what is, what is sort of the ideal of what, uh, humans are going to be doing in the future. And so, you know, for a long time, um, the answer to folks who complains that, well, we're going to, you know, the, the machine looms are going to, uh, uh, throw a lot of weavers out of work and, and, and farm machinery is going to throw a lot of agricultural workers out of work was, um, well, yeah, in the short term, that may be painful. But in the long run, um, what that means is manual labor will be done by machines and uh, the jobs that are left to humans are going to be more attractive, are going to be closer to the kind of thing um, that you would like to spend your time doing. Um and, you know, I think the reason you see this kind of pushback from artists is, um, you know, that it's harder to make that kind of argument. If, if your uh, aspiration was, well, I want to be a composer and I want to be a, um, uh, or I want to be an artist, um, then, you know, it's, it's not that well, you know, then there's something else better you can do, even if uh, the machine takes your old job. This is the, the kind of thing uh, you know, human beings used to to imagine they would be free to do with their time when you know so scarcity was reduced. So I, I'm 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 sympathetic to that, and in particular when you think about um, you know sort of the amplification of a kind of winner take all. So in the near term, right, it might be the case that um, sort of the very highest level of artistic achievement is not something right. ChatGPT is not going to give you um, output on par with you know, I, and, and Kate Jemison or David Foster Wallace or James Joyce, um, it, it's going to give you kind of passable copy. Um, and the same thing with art. It's probably not going to do anything terribly innovative. It's got to, you know, often will have a, a library of a certain number of styles um, and will often give you some fairly confused responses to a prompt. Um, but, you know, the, the top, whatever, 1% of artists, writers, and composers probably don't have anything to worry about. Um, but, you know, as it turns out, um, that's not by definition most of most of the people in those spheres. And to some extent, um, you know, being bad at things is kind of a prerequisite to being good at them. Um, people who are great composers often start out doing you know less uh, rarefied kinds of writing or composition or playing or painting. Um, and so, you know, you, I understand people's anxiety that the kind of work that a writer or a painter or a composer might do while they're honing their craft um, is increasingly going to be, uh, you know, again, unless you get a kind of mass desire for, let's say, the artisanal uh, human-produced version, um, is is going to be hard to justify economically. If you're saying, look, well, all I don't need a you know, a, a great original work of art. What I need is an illustration for this brochure um, or a, uh, you know, a jingle for this advertisement. Um, if you have this expert systems that can do that uh, essentially for free, um, in particular in regions where there isn't a kind of demand on the consumer side for, um, you know, we want the human version of this, um, that's, you know, that's, that's unsettling. And again, you know, unsettling in a way it maybe isn't when people hear, um, you know, gosh, maybe humans having to physically plow the fields isn't going to be a thing anymore. Um, so I, I, you know, I understand the concern. I understand why people view it differently. Um, even though I think, you know, probably what we're, what we're going to see and what we're already ending up seeing is something more like a, uh, a kind of collaborative relationship. I think I think that last point is is right because it it feels less like this will replace people outright and more like this will raise the floor for a lot of people's abilities <laughs> and then 
but the the human touch allows you to go above and beyond that. So you don't publish the article that you wrote with ChatGPT, but you use it as something to refine your ideas with or start get you starter pros to then build off of or help you organize your massive notes into an outline and so on. But I guess the thing that's is striking to me in a lot of the objections to it is they're analogous. You can imagine analogous situations that, again, people don't really complain about in the same way. So they they treat it as this is these models and the work that they do and the kinds of thing they create are qualitatively different somehow than what came before. But but then ignore the the like analogous situation. So the bread baking is one of these that it seems to me to say like there's you know there just is far more artistry in being the person who writes poetry than the person who dedicates their career to the craft of baking bread is just to basically express a, a preference about I happen to like poetry more than bread, but I think you could it would be hard to justify that there's less craft and artistry in one versus the other. Um, but on the like producing stuff that is cheaper, you know, we have more as journalism has seen declining, the, hmm. the market for journalists has has declined in part because you have like you had this wave of 20 somethings who are willing to crank out content for content farms at, you know, vanishingly small salaries because they'd live 20 of them in a Brooklyn walk up, you know, and weren't they. Right. And so, and that, that took jobs away, the content creator job or, or just like entry into the marketplace or internationalizing content creation means that there's now people overseas who will yep. make you a logo for much less because the cost of living in Moldova is much lower than it is in Manhattan. But we don't, we don't see a similar, like it is wrong for you as a company that wants a logo to hire a designer in Moldova versus the much more expensive person in Manhattan. We don't tend to see a, like, we need to stop the kids from ent entering journalism because they're bringing our yep. salaries down, um, devaluing our content, and so on. And so that's, I guess that's what I kind of keep coming back to is it's not clear. It seems to be that the objection is, well, this can do it at scale, mm -hmm. right? But scale is, you know, there are lots of things that can happen at scale. So that's like a, that's a, qual a quantitative difference. Um, and, and then part of it seems to be that like you have, if like you, Julian, want a picture for your wall, you have some sort of moral responsibility to hire a human artist to make right. that picture versus um, a an AI. And that if you can't afford a human artist, your moral responsibility is to not have the picture versus to get it at a price that you can afford, which might right. be free or the $10 a month mid-journey membership or whatever. And so that's, I guess at the broad level, like that's my... My hang up with a lot of this is it seems like the the arguments that are made against this tech, if we took them seriously, would also apply in a lot of domains that they're not typically applied and that people don't seem to feel the same degree of rage about. I mean, the wrinkle here, is, and you know, I don't know if this is necessarily a very good argument, but of course, the argument people raise is, look, these models are all trained on vast amounts of data. So this is, in some sense, um, uncompensated, uncompensated exploitation of the labor of um, uh, all the artists whose work is fed into this. Um, although you also say, well, you know, there's plenty of work that's now in the public domain, so you could do quite a bit of training um, without at least exploiting the labor of any currently living person who has a, a legally recognized right in, in that work. Um, but no, you know, I find that compelling. I think the arguments here are, are really backwards from anxiety about a world in which it's not economically viable to be. Uh, uh, to be an artist or, 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 or a writer, or at least it's not economically viable for more than um, some very small number of people um, to, uh, to pursue that work. Um, you know, and, and we'll see, again, whether that turns out to be the case or whether uh, it's, it's that, um, you know, the, the, the kinds of things that it's 
viable to get hired to do um, alter somewhat um, as uh, as certain tasks are taken over by uh, by AI. Um, you know, I think. Look, I, I think this is somewhat analogous to what we see in um, yeah the complaints about big tech related to to journalism, right? I think aren't arguably, um, or you know, it probably is arguable, but I certainly think it's the case that um, the uh, sort of nose diving of journalism as an industry is bad for humanity, um, that, uh, functioning democracies need, um, people doing journalistic work. And the fact that it's increasingly not viable to underwrite, um, that work is a bad thing. Um, and I think what you see as a result of that is people kind of casting about for a model that's viable. So you will hear people say, so I was at a conference, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, sponsored by the the Knight Foundation, um, where uh, a writer named Cory Doctorow was on stage talking about how um, Google and other uh, search engines that uh, make ad revenue off news sites are stealing from uh, from from newspapers and news sites when they sell ads on search results for that. Now, I think that's um, pretty hard to defend when you when you sort of think about it. Um, we don't think we don't think they're stealing from you know Donald Trump whenever they people search for Donald Trump. Um, but uh, what is motivating the attempt to find a wrong in need of compensation is the absolutely justifiable, uh, I think, reaction that gosh, if it does, if it is no longer economically sustainable for you know, the New York Times and the Washington Post, or at least some institution doing that kind of work to support itself and finance the, you know, the, the, the labor that it takes to, uh, to do good investigative journalism, um, that bodes very ill for uh, democracy, you know, quite apart from whether it makes a, a lot of journalists who, who'd like to earn a salary unhappy. Um, and so, and I think in a sense, the idea that that's unacceptable then drives you to say, well, then, there must be a model that we can justify that makes it tenable again. And so, you know, we can convince ourselves that then, um, you know, Google search that makes money off, uh, off news results must be stealing. And so they owe, um, the money that's got to be paid. Um, it's again, it's not that the moral argument is in itself credible. It's the sense that, um, you know, something has to be true, uh, that enables us to make it viable to to do journalism. So why do we make why does the argument or the the strategy for argumentation against this technology or its widespread use or its unencumbered use flow in that direction? So why is it that say artists who are upset about the potential impact this has on their livelihoods begin with arguments about intellectual property or the the nature of creativity um, or the human touch versus just coming out and saying, look, I work in an industry that I think this is going to demolish. My livelihood depends on that industry persisting, potentially growing, and so on. And so therefore, this technology is bad because it will hurt my livelihood, or therefore this technology is bad because it will lead to a decline in the kind of journalism that is necessary for a democracy to function well. Yeah. Like, they're, why hide the ultimate concern versus just leading with the ultimate concern? I mean, I think I do see some people indeed leading with that concern. So it's not that uh, nobody is saying that, but also, um, you know, in a sense, this is this is the old bootlegger Baptist syndrome, um, right? Um, an appeal to your to your interests is always less generally persuasive than, than an appeal to a principle. So, if you say, um, you know, well, this will lower my or reduce, you know, impair my ability to to make a living, um, you know, one might rightly say, well, you know, new technology often um, shakes up industries in ways that make people. Uh, have to look for other work or, you know, lots of things might make it harder for you to, um, 
to earn a living, and we don't think that's usually a a, a justification for saying we're gonna we're gonna shut down a technology that that's uh, that's made that harder if it's seen as just a you know uh, I personally am the one affected by this. Um, whereas if you can make a kind of uh, uh, Sort of broader argument out of the undesirability of it that's more appealing to a lot of people and you know again in the case of of, of journalism at least i think um there is a, a good argument um about the general sort of sustainability as of yet at least um there's a lot of kinds of reporting ai can't do um because you know it doesn't have legs and you know can't can't just do a lot of things autonomously um Maybe that will change at some point, but for the near future, um, there's lots of kinds of reporting that are difficult for, uh, for AI systems to do. Um, but we have a model for sort of financing journal that's based on selling the writing, not, not sort of selling the labor that goes into it. Of course, you have to, we have to sell as the output, and we have this sort of IP problem of, um, well, we, we recognize copyright um, in the particular expression of let's say you know a, a news report or a news analysis um but not the underlying ideas so if it becomes essentially costless to reproduce all the information effectively in a news story um without uh um without actually infringing copyright without having you know any string of let's say four words that are exactly the same outside of a direct quotation. Um, well, it becomes very hard to, uh, on, on really any model, to sell that content if you also have to pay the overhead of um, the legwork that went into reporting it. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, again, apart from the displeasure this causes to, to journalists who you know, like to earn a salary, um, there is a good sort of society-wide case that um, if it is not possible to underwrite that kind of reporting, that is bad for us collectively. Um, I think one problem is we're at a, a kind of nadir of trust in media. So people are a lot less open to that argument, I think, probably than they ought to be. Um, but also that, it, it, that it's very hard to find a solution that makes a lot of sense for very good reasons. People are not particularly sanguine about the idea of saying, all right, well, if the market can't. Um, you know, functionally underwrite journalism anymore. The uh, the government ought to do it. We sort of understand, I think, for pretty well well trod reasons why that's an unattractive solution. Um, at least as as to the primary solution, there's you know it might be that in a competitive market, having some news outlets that are subsidized isn't isn't that bad an idea. But I don't think anyone likes the idea very much that um, sort of most or all news outlets would require um government largesse to function it would be you know in practice impossible to um to preserve the necessary independence under that that schema um and so then the problem is well what is your what is your alternative funding model then um and so you know casting out for alternatives you know one one answer is all right if the problem to some extent seems to be rooted in uh, in tech and the tech companies have a lot of money, um, you know, finding an argument that makes them, uh, uh on the hook for, uh, for, for, for paying for the process seems, seems attractive, I think, to a lot of people. Uh, you know, but also I see the reality is though, I think it's, it's just going to be very hard to, um, even sort of at a, at a policy level to prevent, you know, without, in a sense, creating equally bad problems, the, the sort of harvesting and copying of, of, of news content that, you know, is already sort of happening in, in kind of human form with sort of content sweatshops um, and seems obviously um, on, the, on the horizon at, at automated scale. So that last point gets to the, the question I wanted to ask, which is basically how new is this and is the wrong thing being blamed for the the malaise in journalism and i should say i i'm very much in agreement that having a robust ecosystem of journalism and a robust culture of journalism is really important i mean both of us used to work for a think tank and our work was ultimately 
parasitic upon, well, first academic mm-hmm. research that we would draw on and, and then journalism, you know, we basically would take those two I mean, things. I was also, I was, I was, I was in fact a journalist for a decade before, uh, before I became a think tanker. Right. So you were producing and then consuming and, and reworking and so much of what, so much of content is just taking and, and remixing and thinking about and analyzing that on the ground reporting. But it's long been the case that hard reporting is not economically viable by itself. So newspapers didn't sell, didn't make money by selling subscriptions to hard reporting. They made money by selling classified ads. Yeah, People who did buy subscriptions, you know, the people, most of most of a newspaper's draw is like the opinion section, the sports section, the entertainment section, et cetera. That's what readers subscribe for. If it was just yeah. the hard reporting, they wouldn't be subscribing in the first place. None of that is new. As you mentioned, there have long been these kind of content farms that take existing journalistic pieces and lightly rewrite them to publish mm-hmm. on various fringy and scammy blogs and so on. None of that is new. And right. and this collapse in journalism, I, mean, I remember seeing somewhere recently, I think it is that like of the kind of major national newspapers, the New York Times is the only one that's profitable. Mm-hmm. Um, but newspapers, you know, the, the economic model has been collapsing for a while and we, and AI hasn't even really begun yet. Yeah. You know, it hasn't be like these, these nightmare scenarios haven't hit yet. Right. No, no, of course, journal, journalism's problems are, are in a sense, um, right, long predate and, and have to do with um, factors unrelated to AI. I mean, it's essentially about the, sort of the um, loss of the ability to, um, you know, sort of leverage a kind of monopoly on the distribution of large amounts of pulped, um, pulped wood um, to lots of households um, and just leverage that to, um, and the attention that came with it um, for, for an advertising model. Um, so, but, um, that said, the industry is already on the ropes and it's not hard to imagine, um, uh, an additional blow at this point, um, being, you know, kind of lethal to the extent it's not already, they haven't given the layoffs we've seen in recent weeks. But I guess, is there a worry that if all the attention is on the problems that these models and technologies might represent um, rather than the, you know, the cultural, like if we can just, it's, you know, we can save journalism if we can just get open AI to stop consuming our content and then regurgitating yeah. it. Or we can just save journalism if we stop Google from indexing our websites versus these kind of cultural, so there's the cultural problem of declining trust in in the institutions and it's hard for the institution to then make a case for their continued relevance and necessity and therefore reasons why you should pay for them in one way or another if people don't trust yep. them but also long running meat like you can tell people that the dirt the hard news is like the vegetables right and you can tell people that eating their vegetables is good for them but yep. they prefer the the sweets of the right. op-ed pages uh, and and that if we if we focus our attention on big tech has lots of money and big tech is doing this thing so we can blame this thing for the problem maybe we can extract some money from big tech and and let that take the eye off the ball of the cultural and consumer preferences then we're at best kind of kicking the collapsing can down the road a bit uh i think that's right although you know, I mean, in a sense, so AI would 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 pose a threat even if you sort of fixed the preference, or even if I don't know, people became more sort of civically responsible and understood the uh, it's sort of better for them to, um, you know, I don't know, consume less listicles and more um, you know, good long form reporting. Um, you would still have the problem of um, of the sort of free riding. Of, of expert systems that can replicate that without um, without violating into intellectual property as as currently conceived, and so I mean one answer is um, I suppose is you know a, a radical rethinking of how intellectual property works, so that um, 
that kind of uh, uh, derivative production would be understood as um, as infringing. Um, that you know, in a sense, putting a, a, an article through an AI that that um, is synthesizes and does a rewrite is um, viewed as creation of a derivative work in a way that sort of the current law probably wouldn't um, wouldn't consider it to be. Um, uh, uh, but um, we, you run into, I think, again, a, a lot of problems there with with you know sort of identifying when it's, it's it, the convenient thing about copyright to some extent. Uh, as it currently operates, is that it is, um, in a sense, based on surfaces, right? Whether two pieces of mu- whether one piece of music infringes on another, does in part depend on whether the right the composer of the second did actually hear um, the the first piece of music. But when you ask her, well, are they different? Enough? It has to do with whether um, whether they are essentially different enough to an ordinary auditor that they sound like different pieces. There's not like a, you know, it's not a, a mathematical or music theoretical definition. It's a kind of ordinary person's response um, uh, standard. Um, but, you know, that at least is, is you know, in some sense transparent um, it, and, uh, uh, you know, based on, I guess, the surface features of the work and not in interrogating the, um, you know, the process that went into composition and what, you know, what internally happened in someone's brain as they were uh, transforming and synthesizing their um, their influences. I will say one, you know, one thing that we've seen as as kind of a response, both at a um, at the kind of at, at different levels, let's say, of of cultural production, is um, right, the very familiar move um, that we see on you know things like YouTube and Twitch to, in a sense, sort of monetizing. Um, yeah, right, the parasocial relationship with the audience more than um, the actual content. So you, know, you may have sponsors and you may have uh, ads that run on your your YouTube video, but the way a lot of um, a lot of the stuff works, in a way, frankly, a lot of a lot of Substackers uh, now are operating is less trying to get people to pay sort of upfront for the content or even try to monetize via ads the content, but by trying to create a sense of a relationship to the human being behind uh, the work um, and a sense that you're, you're, uh, you're supporting uh, a person whose, whose work you appreciate and not merely um, consuming the product. And that is, you know, to some extent, I think that, that leads to some um, potentially somewhat dubious um incentives to create a kind of the illusion of um of a real social relationship when that that doesn't really exist um but we're seeing uh uh you know large enterprises sort of emulate that model as well so you know in the same way that a youtuber might have a you know a level of patreon sponsorship where um you know in the content is free, but also if you're a sponsor, you get to do a Zoom chat with them, or you get to do be on their Discord and have some some kind of communication. Maybe even play a you know a game of some kind with them if they're a game uh, a, a game creator. Um, and we're seeing uh, other industries are shifting toward uh, something very similar, where you, know, you have the Atlantic and and other publications and the New York Times. Um, increasingly moving toward the idea that well the the um you know the prestigious publication is going to create a kind of aura of desirability around um a group of people um and then what you can sell access to is um a physical event where you're going to go and interact with those people um my actually a, a few years ago my my partner um we, we love doing crosswords together got uh as a gift, a little event uh, with Will Shorts, where a bunch of crossword fans, you know, paid some amount to go on a Zoom chat and um, do a little workshop in in crossword constructing. Um, so that was fun, and um, you know, I don't probably not the kind of thing that's going to fund the totality of the New York Times, but um, you know, we're we're seeing a shift toward emphasis. You know, again, both with sort of freelance creators, but also institutions um, toward 
you know, trying to monetize the sense of relationship to a human um, that, you know, again, at least in the short term is, is probably not something AI can copy as well. Um, the question is whether that make you know, whether again, that's enough to fund the operations of the New York times. I worry too, that, that I've seen this in like writer fiction, writer communities where for quite a while, it used to be, you got, you were the writer, you wrote the book, you sent it to your agent, your agent put it in front of an editor at a major publishing house, they published it and marketed it. And maybe you had to go and do some signing somewhere, but your job was just to put words on a page. But that has shifted where even the major publishing houses now basically expect the author to do most, if not all, of the marketing. And you're supposed to be active on social media and building these parasocial relationships in order to sell books. And and that's not just time consuming. It's time that you're not spending putting prose on a page in your typewriter. Yep. But it's also it it basically means that success now selects for features of the author that aren't how good of a book they can write, but instead like maybe yep. how engaging of a personality they are, how good they are at crafting these parasocial relationships, and so on. And is there a similar thing that happens? Like journalism, it seems like there's a tension between the objectivity of hard reporting yep. and the being a personality, especially if the way that you find success is to inject enough of your personality into your work that people are – I, I'm not just reading this breaking news story about yeah. Trump's legal troubles because it's information packed, but because I like the journalist who wrote it. That would seem to potentially drag, like, create incentives to just make your journalism more personality filled. Yeah. But that might come at the expense of the kind of hard objectivity. You know, influencers are not generally the people right. you go to for hard news. Right. No, I mean, I think, and I think, you know, more broadly speaking, um, it would not be desirable if the, you know, the older people who were, were able to have successful careers as novelists or journalists were people who were, you know, skilled at making engaging TikToks, um, or even, you know, uh, frankly, people who are, um, compelling on a stage at, at an event you might, you might pay to see. Um, and also, yeah, I think I think there is something to be said for the idea that um, the uh, decline in in trust in journalism is probably well. I think I have you know I could I could go on for quite a long time about what I think um, the the causes of that are, but I think one factor is um, the rise of social media, sort of breaking the fiction of the journalist as a kind of tabula rasa, um, you know, conveyor. It's not that journalists obviously didn't have, you know, personal opinions about the the things they covered uh, before. They, they of course, always did. Um, but uh, in the sort of the social media era, uh, and I think one reason a lot of newspapers got very skittish and tried to kind of clamp down on um the kind of content it was sort of acceptable for reporters to be producing on social media was um, when that's all visible, when when it's clear um, that, well, you know, in fact, the reporter does have uh, a personal opinion, whether or not they're good at being fair and I don't know if you want to say objective, but but accurate and balanced in their um, in their coverage, um, it makes it, I think, harder for for people to 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 disconnect that and trust that well you know as a professional um that that's not going to be coloring um their coverage and you know to to some extent maybe that's uh that is that is healthy it it, it is you know not a terrible thing to be conscious that um that everything comes from a human's perspective um you know even if they they adopt the conventions of journalism and they talk about this reporter instead of using the first person pronoun. Um, a certain amount of that is is healthy, um, but um, the kind of nihilism about journalism that that um, a lot of the public seems to have fallen into, I think, is less so, and 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 indeed um, not justified by uh, by the underlying facts. Um, so yeah, I mean, all of that said. Um, 
you know, to some extent, that's not new. I mean, it has always been the case that, um, um, you know, an author or musician who was strikingly attractive um, had, you know, great, you know, certain advantages um, um, unrelated to the the quality of the underlying product. There's, you know, and there's probably a lot of uh, of uh, brilliant songwriters who are not particularly photogenic who might like to have their own careers, but about you know wound up um, writing um, writing music for uh, for. Uh, fit and attractive uh people with a, a passable voice and, and less songwriting talent um so that is not uh that is not an entire novelty but yeah i'm, I'm inclined to agree um it is uh, to some extent undesirable but in a way look you know the point you were making earlier was that it's always sort of been the case um that the model for a lot of these industries has been sort of orthogonal to the underlying product, right? So, you know, the, the, the model for journalism was, well, it happens that we are delivering this bundle of pulp paper to people's doorsteps on a daily basis, and that drives a certain amount of attention, and so we can make the money off the fact that, um, uh, you know, there's a bunch of businesses that would very much like people to look at their coupon um, or learn about the new hair tonic that they're releasing, and, um, uh, and so, you know, we can get more revenue from that than people are willing to sort of pony up just for the value they're getting directly from, um, from the, the creative work or the, the, the journalistic work. Um, so, you know, it's always been the case that there is, is that both the, uh, uh, success is subject to a lot of, uh, a lot of factors other than, you know, the quality of the work in isolation, but also that the, you know, the way revenue is driven is often a little bit orthogonal to, um, uh, you know, the work in isolation as opposed to it's, uh, the way it, you know, functions as, uh, um, a hook that, uh, makes something else attractive. Is there potentially then a, a self-correcting mechanism in this. So even before we get get to the question of AI wanting to regurgitate, summarize news, you could tell a story that it's not in, say, Facebook's in economic interest for the entire news industry to collapse because one of the appeals of Facebook is as a replacement to like both of us remember the the Google Reader era. And mm -hmm. you know, I still use an RSS reader to aggregate feeds from a bunch of sources and read them all conveniently in one place. And that's the role that Facebook oh my. plays you read your for. your audiobooks on wax cylinder too? No, I, I have upgraded to listening oh, to those things digitally. But, um, but, you know, Facebook took on that role for a lot of people as this was a place I could go, one place I could go, and I would yeah. see the the stories, the most important stories of the day would show up in my feed. Or Twitter played this role for a lot of a lot of journalists went to their, you know, their primary news source was their curated Twitter feed or sure. Twitter lists. And and so that creates economic value for Facebook or Twitter or whatever is replacing Twitter, because I don't know how many people use it as their primary source of news. Yeah. Now, um, but if if that industry collapsed, then it takes away economic value from them. Similar to if if it shifts to the way that I get my news is I log into Google and have their Gemini AI model tell me what's happened in the world in the last twenty four hours. That the value of that to me depends on how good the data is that Google is able to consume. And and so it's these people who are being blamed for the collapse of the industry would seem to have a very strong economic interest, if not a just like civic, you know, democratic values interest in seeing a healthy news industry producing the kind of content that they're dependent on. And so should we, I guess, just have a relative degree of optimism that because of these financial incentives – even if you or I can't immediately imagine what the new model to pay for it, like it's no longer 
selling subscriptions because of the opinion pages. It's no longer selling classified ads. Those models of subsidizing news don't work. But we can be relatively confident a new one will come along. I, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm not that confident, um, in part because, you know, Meta and, and Facebook seem to have made the calculation that for various reasons, they um, do not want to be a major news source anymore. They don't think, it seems, that um, the revenue that they can sort of hope to net from people consuming news on their platforms is worth the candle, even without, well, it's not without bringing in the question of subsidy, partly because uh, in a lot of countries, you see news outlets trying to um, you know, effectively get their cut of ad revenue from platforms that are running news content, um, but also um, because it brings a lot of political scrutiny um, and ends up getting people dragged in front of uh, 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 congressional hearings if the way their algorithm is handling news is not to the liking of um, you know one faction or another politically. Um, so, uh, you know, again, at least that company has very clearly decided they've sort of essentially said, uh, look, on, on threads, on, on Meta's sort of Twitter clone, um, we're um, you know, algorithmically sort of de-emphasizing political content, except for people who actively tell us they want to opt into seeing more of it, um, because frankly, it's, it's, it's sort of a hassle. It's, it's, um, it's not worth it. Um, and so I think, I think it's an open question um, whether um, whether whether they're going to sort of step up to the plate, it's also I think an open question whether, to the extent they find it um, worthwhile to invest in that, they're going to invest in a way that you know happily dovetails with the sort of civic motives for which you would want a um, uh, uh, you know healthy journalism. Obviously, we already don't have. Um, you know, journalism that, you know, perfectly overlaps with um, what you would want the resource allocation to be if what you were, you know, maximally interested in was a well-informed uh, democratic polis capable of, of, you know, governing itself in a reasonable way. Um, so, you know, perhaps we shouldn't be, be comparing um, uh, imperfect real-world results to, um, to the ideal um, but I mean, certainly we shouldn't, um, but we don't know what the kind of journalism they would find it worthwhile to fund for kind of traffic driving purposes. Right? We don't know how far, let's say it deviates from, um, the kind of journalism you, you probably think is necessary for, um, a, a well-functioning Republic. And again, you know, a lot of this has, I think, very little to do with um with ai um it's just that ai is kind of the monosodium glutamate uh for a lot of existing trends and that it's it just makes it possible to ratchet up the speed and the scale so right another problem is well it turns out people um you know like news but they would rather have news that sort of flatters their priors and um reinforces their their um, you know, their pre-existing world view, view or their kind of tribal identification. Um, and so, you know, the economic situation that, that kind of created the Edward R. Murrow, that's the way it is, um, style of journalism that presents itself as objective, at least, uh, or, you know, makes some kind of attempt to approximate whatever objectivity means, um, was fundamentally about, um, right, you, it's really only sustainable to have a couple newspapers in most cities. Um, there's a limited number of broadcast television channels. You don't want people to flip away. Um, so it doesn't make sense to try and narrow cast. Um, but, you know, increasingly now, well, it is viable to try and, uh, and narrow cast. Um, and that was true before AI. It's even more true um, with AI when you can have a kind of bespoke um, version of the news article that's tailored to precisely um, your your set of friars and you know has some maybe um, kernel of shared fact, um, but you know, the emphasis and context is geared toward what is going to maximize your continued engagement 
um, with that piece of content. Um, and so I think if you tell, you know, Google or Meta, um, or, you know, hey, you can get more engagement out of people um, if you, to some extent, subsidize the production of news, um, the kind of news they produce is going to be very much geared toward uh, maximizing engagement. Um, and, you know, the kind of news that satisfies that criteria might be um, suboptimal on, on a lot of other dimensions we care about. Thank you for listening to Reimagining Liberty. If you like the show and want to support it, head to reimaginingliberty.com to learn more. You'll get early access to all my essays, as well as be able to join the Reimagining Liberty Discord community and book club. That's reimaginingliberty.com, or look for the link in the show notes. Talk to you soon.